Let us turn to Acts chapter 18 this morning. Acts chapter 18, and we will cover several verses in that chapter, and I will start reading here. Acts 18, 1, 2, 3. <clears throat> After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade and stayed with them and worked, they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So before we go to the next portion, you know, uh, what happens after this is that Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia with uh, with some financial support. Uh, we see that, we can tie that to some of the epistles when Paul says this. And, and then in the Acts it says that Paul decides then to stop the tent making and f focus fully on preaching the word. And now we're going to uh, Acts 18, uh, 18 through 19. After this, Paul spayed, stayed, uh, may, many days longer, and then uh, took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At uh, Centrea, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So as we see here, Paul uh, arrives in Ephesus with Priscilla and Aquila and leaves them behind and moves on forward. Now we're going to, they're focusing in now on what happens in, uh, in Ephesus, Acts 18, 24 and 26, and this was talked about last week a, a bit. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Um, and uh, there's a couple more portions I want to read from the epistles. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 19. It may be on the screen. And, and Paul says this, The churches of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Prisca, or Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. So in this, uh, in this particular portion, Aquila and uh, Priscilla are in Ephesus in a, and they have a house church. But when you jump, to, uh, uh, jump back to Romans 16, 3 and 4, Paul says this, Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. So at this portion, in the, when uh, Paul wrote the uh, letter to the, uh, the churches in Rome, Aquila and uh, Priscilla were in Rome and then having a house church. So they seem to, they're from Rome, they're from Italy, and they had to leave because of the, um, of the command that came from Claudius to leave Rome. That They had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so they, uh, because of that, because of that change in their circumstance, they got to meet uh, Paul at, in Corinth. And so that's what we just read, uh, history, what happened after that. Um, and there's also one other portion, uh, which may not be on the screen, but in 2 Timothy 4.19, it talks about, uh, Paul tells Timothy that uh, to greet, um, greet uh, Aquila and Priscilla in, in Ephesus. So, um, so they seem to have uh, bounced between Ephesus and Rome uh, during their time uh, uh, in, in their ministry and in their life. So... Um, as you can see, I, I'm, I'm picking on a common thread in all the scripture portions I just read. Um, uh, 
I want to take this brief time just to talk about uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Um, and, you know, we live in a time that is vastly different than the time of the early church. Um, we may have some, pers- we may think the early church was a certain way, but and, and what I'm convinced of is if we were to have a, some time machine to go back in time and to just put ourselves in the circumstance, especially in the Gentile churches, especially, say, uh, we became tent makers with uh, Priscilla and Aquila, we'll be surprised. We'll be surprised to how how differently thing, how different things were uh, compared to what it was today. And I'm talking that as of it in a good way. Sometimes we restrict a lot of things. And, and I think back then, depending on the region that you were in, things were a lot more practical and open-minded. So uh, today, uh, I want to bring up three ways in which both Priscilla and Aquila could help us see ministry in a whole different light. And... You know, as I share my thoughts, know that I, I put a lot of thought into this. I, 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 I know what some of the things I will say will, will definitely uh, not be the most uh, acceptable things, uh, just knowing our church, the pulse of a church and churches as a whole. But I, I, fe- I felt a burden to share uh, certain things that uh, I will share with uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit, with wisdom and, uh, uh, and with, uh, uh, with tact. So um, from the example of Priscilla and Aquila, and I have three points that I want to share. One, the example of Priscilla and Aquila shows that women can be entrusted to serve in significant ministry roles. Now, when we look at the whole scope of scripture, when Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, um, only in one point place it says, uh, I believe it's in a couple of places, it says Aquila, then Priscilla. Uh, but every other, like four of the other times, it's Priscilla and then Aquila. Especially when it talks about uh, what we read when um, Apollos had to be corrected. It, talked, it said Priscilla and Aquila. And there's a reason for that. I mean, when we look at how the people and ministers were ordered or apostles were ordered, there was, there's always, you know, it's Peter, James, and John. It's not, you know, James, John, James, John, and Peter, right? There, there's a, it, it's not about value, it's about the significance of that contribution or that leadership. Uh, or Paul and Silas, it's not Silas and Paul, or Barnabas, it's not Barnabas and Paul, it's Paul and Barnabas. And in the same way, in, when it came to, um, in this case, in uh, verse 18 to 19 of, of Acts 18, um, or sorry, 24 to 26 of Acts, eight, uh, Acts 18, when Apollos, this very eloquent and uh, this fiery preacher came who was very competent in, in showing the Christ in the Old Testament, he came in, he spoke in the synagogue. It was a, a Priscilla and Aquila, right? The Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, they heard him and took him aside. Both of them together took him aside, and from the, just the ordering of things, and from the order we see in the epistles, we, see, we can see that Priscilla played a more involved role in ministry. And, and, and in light of where we are today, it almost seems surprising that, uh, and I hate to say this, but uh, that it shouldn't be, but it almost seems surprising that a woman would take the lead role to correct a, a fiery, eloquent preacher that's never really seen. Usually, it's expected that the woman would play a background role of just maybe, you know, socially distancing a bit, right? Uh, and, and being, you know, being, be, being careful to not offend and letting the man speak and all of that. The, all those things that we, all those notions that we have in our mind, it's really from the culture aspect of things. But here, there's a certain kind of boldness and a confidence. There's a fervor that Priscilla has to be the person to make this happen. But, you know, I will talk about Aquila as well. But in this case, I'm, I'm trying to, to show that it is absolutely encouraged and it is okay, sisters of God, sisters of Christ, to be confident in your knowledge of scriptures, to be willing to learn scriptures and devour scriptures and find out faults in teachings 
And, and here we have to also look at the way that they correct him. They took him aside. They did not scream in the middle of a synagogue meeting, right, and say, you're wrong. You know, they, they took him aside privately and uh, explained the full gospel. It was not, you know, what he knew was great, but it was not the complete picture. And so that, that is uh, the one way that we could see and just, just picking Priscilla alone. And now if I were to go into other examples, let's, let's talk about Phoebe in Romans chapter 16, verse 1. If, if it might be on the screen, Romans 16, 1. Now I just want to read that just to emphasize this point that perhaps our notions about women and ministry are a bit uh, more constrained than they ought to be. And I have my own views. I might, if, if the Lord leads me, and I have it here in my notes, but uh, depending on time, I'll talk about my view uh, in all of this. But I, I also think that women have a much, much more involved role in ministry than it is in reality today. So Romans 16, 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant or deacon of the church at Centrea. Now, there's different ways of saying that word. I, I had to listen to an audio Bible to know what that, how to say that. That you may, be, may welcome her in the Lord in a way that worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a, pa- a patron or a benefactor, helper of many and of myself as well. In the book of Romans, uh, especially at the last chapter, I think about ten, the name of ten women are mentioned. And, and especially among the women, it's not just names thrown. It is actually Paul is describing their role and, and, and they, also their relationship with him. He, talk, he, he says, uh, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, he calls Persis the beloved, and Mary. All of these women worked hard in the Lord, worked very hard in the Lord. Now, what they did is, is, is probably a guess to us. I mean, a lot of... A lot of things that happen in other churches is, you know, you have to look at the historical accounts and what people may, other people may have said in the history books about the role of women in the society. There's a lot to dig there. But when Paul says somebody worked hard in the Lord, what, I mean, it has to be more than being a ladies coordinator or a food coordinator or uh, maybe even praying as well. Not, not to diminish any of those roles, but there must have been far more responsibilities and far more tasks that these women did than just, those, uh, than just the things that we, we tend to assume that are meant for women. The thing, the thing also in those days is that, um, especially in, in parts of Europe, uh, and uh, women had a much prominent role, even prior to Christianity coming to those regions. Uh, women were rich, women were businessmen, women, uh, they, um, you know, they handled matters on their own. They, uh, they you know, they, they, were, they were leaders. Um, and when we read it through Acts, and a lot of them we kind of read past and didn't focus on them, but when people came to the Lord in these areas, it says that the leaders, women leaders, and they talk about women leaders that came to the Lord, or, or the Jews approaching the women leaders and trying to rile them against Paul. All these things are there when we read through Acts. And so, you know, the church and Paul in particular, you know, brought them along, right? Brought them along in that umbrella, in that cultural context to say, becoming to Christianity does not mean all of a sudden you need to uh, not be, uh, not use your gifting, not use, you know, everything that you have, all your resources, now, what all those women did were, was challenge all of those, challenge all those into the church. You know, the, the, the hard, all these women played a very significant role in the early church. And, and you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of, uh, lot of accounts to give us more clarity about this. I wish we did because, uh, you know, a couple of verses, in it, whether it's in 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy, have been amplified more than others. You know, the one verse is, you know, women must remain silent. The other one is, you know, women ought not to teach or have authority over men. But in light of just everything that we, we see in the practice, especially Paul, this, the author of those words, it, that, those couple of verses that are amplified more than any others 
may be much more uh, may be suited for that local situation more than anything else. Or it may be deal due to the fact that women in that region were more uneducated and, pro and let me use the word uncultured in a way that they, they just ca caused disorder in the church. Now, I've been in this church for over um, 15 years, I believe, and I haven't today seen anyone cause disorder. But in those days, it... It was a major issue. Like you could not have a service, a, a peaceful, a, a joyful, a a a, um, a spirit-led service without someone or another, especially on the women's side, causing disruption. And so Paul, being practical in this sense, also he commanded that, you know. And and then you know there. So one thing that to take into account also is that these were not Jewish women. These these are. Gentile women that had no background whatsoever into the Jewish context. So Paul had to almost teach them proper etiquette, proper you know, order, all from scratch. It's almost like how God led people, the Israelites, right, out of Egypt. There's this kind of back-to-basics kind of teachings that, uh, that Paul had to do with these Gentile congregations. But if you look, just like I read from what Paul said uh, about the women that uh, you know were part of his ministry, and another one I, I want to bring up is Euodia and Syntyche, and we brought this up in a, the previous message in Philippians. The whole reason, the, mon the major theme of Paul, Paul's um, uh, um, writings in the, to the Philippians was to to bring these two women leaders together. They had a they had a conflict, and and Paul says at the end, Philippians or towards the end, Philippians four two and three on the screen, it could be on the screen. I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have, been la who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, if, if these women worked side by side with them in the gospel, what role were they playing? Side by side with Apostle Paul. All right, I think I made my point there. Uh, point two, the example of Priscilla and Aquila shows that married couples can be effective partners in ministry. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Okay. Uh, every time Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, their both names are mentioned at every instance. Um, and every, about six times, I believe, it's mentioned. They worked together. They, there were ten makers together. They, they ministered together. They approached people like Apollos together. They uh, conducted service at their house. They had a house church both in Ephesus and in, 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 the, in Rome. I mean, the, the, they, you know, they are the definition of hashtag goals in terms of what a ministry, what a couple in ministry can look like. And there's a lot that I know I can... And Benita and I can learn from Priscilla and Aquila. In fact, we pray often when we bless couples, their names come up at the very end, starting with, you know, those from the past, right? So, um, those, you know, the, the relationship that Priscilla and Aquila had and the admiration, they were famous in their own right in, in that in that particular sphere. You know, when people heard Priscilla and Aquila, they heard of the, the, the couple that uh, partnered with Paul, that took care of Paul, that, that you know, gave up, they just, uh, they just came to Corinth, in fact. And then Paul comes by, and Paul, after about a year, says, let's go to, uh, let's go to Ephesus. And so they jumped to Ephesus. You know, this is a, a story of faith, of conviction. We don't know if, uh, you know, Paul... Uh, brought them to the faith or if they were in the faith before that. There are you know, multiple, um, you know, multiple theories on that. Um, uh, and, and so you know, we, we're seeing a, a couple that is sold out for the gospel. And I think also in the cultural context of today, there's an assumption that the man takes lead and the woman quietly supports behind. And I think that, all, that notion also needs to be challenged um, that both the husband and the wife together can be co-equal partners in 
ministering to people and, and doing God's ministry. Like, I, I mean, I don't know if it's really my role to encourage the sisters in this church, but there's so much that God has given you, so many gifts that God has given you, so, many, so much knowledge that God has poured into your heart, so much wisdom that God has given you. Like, do not waste the gift that God has given you. Another couple mentioned, and this is, again, we don't have a lot of other information on it, but Philemon, you know, when Paul writes to Philemon, he, he talks, he, in the opening greetings, he says, Philemon, uh, Aphia, I, I guess that's how you say her name, uh, he says a sister in the Lord, he greets a sister, uh, but it's Philemon's wife is what they say, and then he, they also think that the Archippus is, uh, is their son, but again, that's all just particular theories. The last point I want to make um, is that the example of Priscilla and Aquila shows that our workplace or our school is our primary mission field. You know, sometimes we categorize secular world and we say anything in church is the sacred. You know, secular, sacred. We make this uh, separation in, even in our minds and in, even in our actions too. I, I, you know, I... I think there's each of us have this think that we need to have this sacred, you know, secular side of, you know, the secular Justin that, uh, you know, looks, you know, that looks different than the church Justin, you know. And again, like I do believe, like in church, it's home, it's a spiritual home for us. We can be relaxed in certain things and to be more expressive in our worship to God, be more open about the things of God. Uh, just like we were in home, you know, we don't have to be dressed up at home and, you know, we are comfortable, right? And so and then in some sense, we don't bring all those aspects to the workplace, but, but in the core of us, right? When it comes to me as a person, I need to be the same, whether I'm in a workplace, whether I'm in the church, whether I'm in ho- at my house, me at, at the core, my integrity, my character, my Thoughts about God, my, my love for people, my love for my coworkers, my love for my family members, my love for my church, brothers and sisters, all needs to be the same. And here, Priscilla and Aquila, and I mentioned this, I'm, I'll just briefly mention again. Priscilla and Aquila were very dedicated to their work. So much so that Paul decided to join along with them because, you know, he cannot get all the supplies for tent making, uh, and, and he needed a couple that was ministry minded, that was ministry focused, and, and was faithful to their work. You know, knowing Paul, we all know Paul pretty well. You know, he has high standards. You know, if he told uh, uh, Mark to not, not to join Mark in ministry, you know, you know he he has very high standards. So Pris- Priscilla and Aquila also had very high standards as to their work. And, you know, some of you sitting here, you know, we all make excuses time to time uh, about there is a confusion. Even I face it as well. Like, what does the call for ministry look like? You know, um, is ministry uh, something that, and Pastor mentions this often, you know, that it's not just full-time ministry. It's about, uh, you know, ministry at the workplace, ministry in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, um, in the grocery store. You know, the, the, there's no limits to where we can do ministry. And I just wanted to give some, um, some guidelines, uh, you know, for those who are thinking and praying about this. How, how do I discern my call for ministry? And I'll, I'll just quickly go through this because of lack of time. How do I call, how discern my call for ministry? And this is for both brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, God will give you an overwhelming desire. And, or, or an overwhelming, overwhelming desire to serve him or overwhelming burden to burden for people. He gives you a holy restlessness. And what I mean by that is like it's holy because, you know, we feel restless about a lot of things. We feel restless about our current jobs. We feel restless about, you know, our car, restless about our homes. This is a holy restlessness because this holy restlessness is a desire to be selfless and to, and to put aside your ambitions and your dreams for the sake of others. And this is a gift of God that God places in those who have this calling. 
Second, God opens doors in your life to minister to others. And we have a difficult time with this one because either you, you tend to balance in two different extremes. You think, oh, you know, if God is going to open the door, then I, I can just be idle, do nothing. You know, I'll, be, I'll do nothing until God opens the door. Or you'd be in the other extreme of you're knocking on every door and you're prying open doors. You know, you're trying to get it open so you can get in. It's not none of those extremes. But instead, and this is something we already know, we have to be faithful in the little. Where, what God has given you, do it to the best of your ability. It might be a very insignificant, insignificant thing. Maybe to you, but not to others. Not to that person that you are talking to. Not to that, that the church congregation you're ministering to. Again, we have this grandiose ideas of ministry like it has to be international. You know, nowadays with a lot of promotion and stuff, it, that our face needs to be on there. You know, it, that's not what ministry is all about. Thirdly, God, third, God confirms your ministry and your gifting through other saints. And this is also a tricky area because you don't want to rely on other people's confirmation too much. Yet, uh, you don't want to rely on it too little as well. There's a healthy balance in here. There, there, confirmation is a good thing. You know, and, and we have to be humble about the fact that, you know, we all think we're the best. We all think we're the best at speaking. We all think we're the best at singing. We all think we're the best at this and that. And then there's also the negative side of we think we're the worst at preaching, worst at singing. You know, that, again, we're balancing these extremes. And, and you know, we've got to know areas that we are not as gifted at and say that's, that's okay. You know, maybe God has a gift for me in this area. Uh, or we need to know that we are growing in that gift. You know, it's a growth process. Fourthly, and I invite the worship fourth, <laughs> and I invite the worship team to come forward. God takes you to a unique, through a unique journey of trials and suffering. The suffering is to strengthen you in His grace, so that your relationship. To God is not tied to ministry success. Your relationship with God is not tied to the results. Your relationship with God is tied to the grace He has given you in your weakness. And we know this from the Apostle Paul. Those are four different ways that you can discern your call for ministry. Um, at the end of the letter of Apostle Paul to the Colossians, Paul says, to, uh, Paul says to the, the, church of, uh, the church, say to Archippus, see that you fulfill your ministry that you have received in the Lord. See that you fulfill your ministry that you have received in the Lord. So like I mentioned earlier, Archippus is speculated to be Philemon's son, uh, but that's just a side point. If it was true, that would be such an encouraging thing to see the second generation of believers being called into this ministry by none other than Apostle Paul, encouraged into the ministry. And so, so people like Timothy as well, right? We know this. So brothers and sisters, there's a, there's a ministry assigned to you by Jesus Christ. And our responsibility is to fulfill that ministry. By fulfilling it, think about bringing it to completion. It's a, it's a process. It's not an instant process. We bring this, this dream of God in our hearts into a reality. This is what fulfilling means. And when we think of ministry, ministry is not an organization. Ministry is not a career. Ministry is not an international platform. It simply means service. Service. I hope that just... You know, when I, that thought came to my mind, ministry is just service. That to put a load, a lot of burden off my back. When you see ministry as what it is, that word means servant or service. What kind of service has Jesus assigned to you? Heavenly Father, we come before you, throne of grace. So, oh Lord, we. We, uh, we 
Cast our burdens at your feet, O oh Lord God. We thank you, O oh God, that you in, you come down, O oh God, every generation, generation after generation, and you give a dream and a call to men and women alike to be servants, O oh Lord God. And I pray, Lord, this day, O oh Lord God, that many dreams and calls in people's hearts will be confirmed. Also pray that many people here would hear the call of God and, and be led by that call to serve, to give up their lives as a living sacrifice, to build up others, oh God, to equip others, oh Lord God. And those who are burdened, oh Lord God, those who are, are, are uh, burned out in their service right now would feel, God, a, a assurance of the, the Holy Spirit just to encourage them, just to tell them to press on forward, go forward. Take each day as it is. Don't think about tomorrow. Think about today. What you can do for the Lord today. And I pray, O oh Lord God, your presence will be with each one of us this morning. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.